I would make this war as severe as possible and show no symptoms of tiring till the South begs for mercy. Union General William Tecumseh Sherman. This is the man that crushed the South. Sherman's march to the sea. The resounding victory of the Union forces in the Chattanooga campaign of November 1863 sent shockwaves through the Confederate ranks, shattering their morale like thunderous cannons on a battlefield and leaving them standing amidst the echoes of defeat and despair. But why Atlanta? The Confederates strategically employed Atlanta as a central element, leveraging its crucial role as both a vital transportation hub and an essential industrial center in their grand strategy. In the strategic calculations of Union leadership, the unquestionable reality emerged. The fall of Atlanta would cast a colossal shadow of peril over the Confederacy, spelling undeniable jeopardy for their entire cause. The newly appointed General-in-Chief Ulysses S. Grant entrusted General William T. Sherman to command the Western armies to capture Atlanta and crush the Confederate morale. But who would stand in between Sherman and Atlanta? Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston and the Army of Tennessee, along with his commanders Lieutenant General William J. Hardy, Lieutenant General John Bell Hood, Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk, and Major General Joseph Wheeler. Greatly outnumbered, Johnston's strategic approach stood as a bastion of caution. He aimed to impede Sherman's relentless advance by strategically deploying defensive positions and orchestrating skirmishes to gradually wear down the formidable Union forces. Unfortunately for Johnston, this strategy was not popular with his peers and leadership. Exhibiting strategic brilliance, General Sherman, with masterful finesse, sidestep direct clashes with Johnston's forces and, instead, orchestrated flanking maneuvers. Growing impatient of Johnston's tactics, General Hood fervently pressed him to adopt a more aggressive stance on the battlefield. In a bold departure from official channels, Hood communicated directly with the Richmond government, vehemently criticizing Johnston's actions and labeling him as both ineffective and weak-willed. As the losses piled up for General Johnston and the Confederacy, and as Sherman inched closer and closer to Atlanta, Confederate President Jefferson Davis lost his patience. Ultimately, on July 17th, Davis relieved Johnston from his command, designated John Hood as his successor. But this leadership change was too late and would prove to be a long-term costly mistake. The Army of Tennessee had endured considerable losses by this juncture, rendering it challenging for Hood to achieve anything of notable consequence against the overwhelming numbers commanded by Sherman. To make things worse for the Confederates, Sherman preferred Hood's reckless military tactics to Johnston's defensive approach. The openness of the subsequent battles would allow General Sherman to flex his numbers and firepower and eventually come knocking on the door of Atlanta. During the night of September 1st, General Hood initiated the evacuation of Atlanta and commanded the destruction of rail cars loaded with ammunition and other various military supplies. The next day, on September 2nd, Atlanta fell to Union forces. On September 4th, General Sherman issued Special Field Order 64, marking the conclusion of the Atlanta campaign. The successful capture of Atlanta significantly uplifted Union morale and played a pivotal role in securing the re-election of President Abraham Lincoln. While stationed in Atlanta, the troops undertook the construction of their living quarters, facilitated the evacuation of a majority of the civilian population, took a much needed rest, replaced worn out equipment, reorganized their forces, and made meticulous preparations for their upcoming campaign. But what was next for General Sherman now that Atlanta had been captured? On November 12th, Sherman devoted several days to the task of obliterating all military assets in Atlanta, leaving no stone unturned, including the crucial railroads. On November 15th, 1864, the Army began its withdrawal from Atlanta, heading towards Savannah, beginning his march to the sea. But why Savannah? The reason for choosing Savannah lay in its pivotal role as a crucial port for the Confederacy, serving as a vital connection for their import-export activities, essential for sustaining the war effort. Recognizing the strategic importance of Savannah, Sherman was determined to stop at nothing to capture it, understanding that securing the city could bring the Union one step closer to victory. Unleashing the full force of an epic scorched earth military strategy, Sherman embarked on a relentless campaign. His vision extended beyond destroying just military installations, but also industry, 
infrastructure, and the very fabric of civilian life on the path to Savannah. Striking deep into enemy territory, he and his fearless troops cut their own supply lines, forging a pact with the untamed land around them. This audacious strategy involved appropriating resources from neighboring farms to fuel the relentless march, with a singular focus on shattering Georgia's railroads, manufacturing, and agricultural stronghold. In the crucible of war, Sherman's pursuit of victory transcended convention, leaving an indelible mark on military history. On November 15, 1864, Sherman would begin the 37-day, 300-mile-long journey with a lean 62,000 men. In 1929, British military historian B.H. Liddell Hart characterized Sherman's army as perhaps the most proficient group of military craftsmen in the modern world. He described them as individuals adept at managing their own sustenance and well-being, capable of covering long distances with minimal fatigue, engaging in battles with minimal exposure, and, most importantly, executing swift and thorough actions. Sherman's army was divided into two wings and a cavalry division. On his right wing, the Army of the Tennessee, commanded by Major General Oliver Howard. On Sherman's left wing, the Army of Georgia, commanded by Major General Henry Slocum. And directly under Sherman was the Cavalry Division, commanded by General Judson Kilpatrick. The Cavalry offered support to both wings. Confederate Lieutenant General William J. Hardy had the job of stopping this well-oiled machine headed his way. Regrettably for Hardy, General John Bell Hood had strategically redirected the bulk of Georgia's forces to Tennessee, with the intent of enticing Sherman into a pursuit. Compounding the challenge, Hardy's army struggled to augment its effective force, never surpassing a measly 13,000 troops. From the outset, the Confederate campaign faced challenges as confusion marred their efforts, making it challenging to decipher Sherman's marching direction. Sherman's advance proceeded smoothly until Howard's right wing encountered significant opposition in the Battle of Griswoldsville on November 22nd yet the Union ultimately secured the victory. By December 10th, the armies led by Sherman had arrived on the outskirts of Savannah. Hardy strategically entrenched 10,000 men in advantageous positions for battle, while flooding the nearby rice fields, leaving only narrow causeways as approaches to the city. Additionally, Sherman faced obstacles in linking up with the U.S. Navy for supplies. To overcome these obstacles, Sherman sent cavalry to Fort McAllister, guarding the Ogeechee River, aiming to clear the route and access the supplies on the Navy ships. The swift conclusion of the Battle of Fort McAllister on December 13th allowed Sherman to secure the vital supplies and siege artillery essential for the Savannah invasion. Hardy, however, chose not to stay and surrender. Instead, on December 20th, he opted to flee and fight on another day, guiding his men across the Savannah River using an improvised pontoon bridge. The following morning, Mayor Richard Dennis Arnold of Savannah surrendered the city to Sherman. This concluded his march to the sea. But Sherman's job was not done. Following a month of rest in Savannah, Sherman embarked on a northern march in what is known as the Carolinas Campaign. His aim was to finalize his turning movement and unite his armies with Grants to confront Robert E. Lee and put an end to the Civil War. Sherman's march to the sea, while hailed as a strategic masterpiece, was not devoid of controversy. The scorched earth tactics employed by Sherman provoked heated debates and divided opinions on the ethical and moral implications of warfare. The deliberate destruction of civilian infrastructure, the ransacking of cities, and the displacement of non-combatants sparked outrage among some, questioning the boundaries of acceptable conduct in times of conflict. Critics argued that Sherman's ruthless brilliance crossed ethical lines, causing unnecessary suffering among Southern civilians and tarnishing the principles of civilized warfare. The controversy surrounding the march underscores the tensions between military necessity and the humanitarian aspects of war, leaving a complex legacy that continues to be dissected and debated by historians and scholars alike. Sherman's bold tactics, while effective in altering the course of the war, have remained a source of moral scrutiny and historical reflection.